tuned in to the Community Cast podcast. Ready? Let's go. Hey there, this is Kristen. I'm the Community Cats Podcast Technical Tabby, and I'm popping in to let you know that this is the second part of a two-part series called From the Backyard to the Front Page, Building a TNR Movement. And that was presented by our friends at Neighborhood Cats. Part one aired last week, and if you haven't listened to it yet, it's probably a great idea to go back and listen to that one before you check this one out. In the second half of this set of special episodes, Brian Cordes, National Programs Director at Neighborhood Cats and one of our favorite TNR experts, is going to focus on how to determine what services your TNR organization might need to provide to your community, how to recruit help and get community buy-in so that you can get your project done, and what kind of equipment you'll need, and also some additional details you'll need to consider to get this job done right. If you're enjoying this and would love to see the presentation with all of the slides and videos and handouts, stop by our website at www.communitycatspodcast.com slash TNR training and you'll scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page to the video section, and you can check it out there. We do want to thank you for tuning in again to these special episodes and for dedicating yourself to turning your passion for cats into action. I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, so on that note, before we get into the more general part, kind of gone over the history of neighborhood cats now, and now we'll start to talk about more generally the specifics of the program that you might want to create. I want to emphasize that it's not one size fits all that I'm drawing from our experience in New York City, but every community is going to be a little bit different. And if you are in a rural or a small town, it's going to be a lot different. And you may adopt the complete opposite model. One of the things I used to talk about early on when I would talk about community TNR programs was the difference between an expert and a grassroots approach. So if you take an expert approach, basically your TNR program is kind of handling almost everything. And that's because you're working with a rural or a small, relatively small population base. And you're just not going to have that pool of people that you could pull a lot of volunteers out of. In that case, you as the TNR program may have to do a lot more of the steps. And that may be very doable given the size of your community. And that would be an expert approach. A more grassroots approach would be what we did in New York City, which is to try to, where it's just not physically possible for one group to handle the kind of volume, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of cats, where, so in that situation, it's essential to create more involvement and to, you know, do what you can not to have to do. And with an expert Group, your kind of program, you're doing as much as you can. And with a grassroots program, you're doing as little as you can <laughs> so that you can spread what resources you have as far as possible. So my focus today is on the grassroots program, but understand that you know, it may not apply. You may, but I think you could probably still pull out elements that will be helpful for you. So this is the route, the path that a caretaker in New York City would follow and still does follow to this day in order to be, you know, participate in TNR. So the first step is actually our step as the program, which is to let people know that we're here and that we're available and that we have resources to offer. So that can be, well, these days, a lot of that would be social media. What you're seeing there were posters that were space that was donated in local malls. We also got space donated in local newspapers. So again, these days, probably a lot more online, but the basic idea is just to get the word out and let people know you're available. Somebody would see our outreach and then contact us. So step two is they're calling us. Once they they were interested with the contact, we would explain what Trap New Return is and you know, just a very kind of quick sketch of, of the process. Now, for the majority of people calling in, most people are what we call able-bodied, right? Meaning they're physically capable of doing a TNR project. Now, that doesn't mean they want to or will, but they can. So we're trying in a grassroots situation where we're being flooded with requests and we're trying to maximize our impact and get the most we can out of what resources. We're looking for those people who are not only able-bodied, but are willing. 
this can evolve over time as your program grows. Now it's, you know, obviously 24 years later in New York City, we can help a lot more people. We can help a lot more people who are disabled, who, who just are not physically able to do the work. We can even help people who could do the work, but, you know, I'm too busy, you know, I'm my kid, my job, my this. We can help them now. But in the very beginning, when this is just a real important point for those of you who are starting out, in the beginning of the program, you're trying to find people who can do it and will do it. And you're going to have to be tough about that and not go because you could spend all your time helping one difficult caretaker who can't contribute anything. And in all that time and resources you spend on that one project, you could have trained 10 other people who would have done the work and you would have had a much bigger impact with your time and resources. So in the beginning, you have to find those people. So we would explain that, you know, you got to participate. Again, at, we would make exceptions for high priority top, you know, if, if it was a government agency, we would do a lot more, for example, or occasionally you do get a very sympathetic case and you just help them because usually they're elderly or, you know, they can't lift a trap, something like that. But you have to focus your effort on people who can and will. So those people attend a training. Nowadays, you, you can use our monthly workshops if you'd like to or set up your own. And then after that, after they've been trained and, and not just had a trap, but also had to access local services, you let them schedule the spay neuter and arrange to pick up equipment. You're not doing that for them. You may help them with, hey, here's where the services are, but they need to make that call. They need to schedule that stuff. But the trapping, ideally, again, they're doing the trapping. What we found as a program is, especially as we develop more and more volunteers, is that if we send somebody on the first day of a trapping, a volunteer who's an expert, the project goes a lot better. So you might consider having what we call TNR coaches. You might consider having that as part of it. But again, the bulk of the work is the responsibility of the caretaker. Also, the transport and the recovery post-surgery is the caretaker's responsibility and then the release. So you're hearing me say a lot of steps that the caretaker is responsible for. That's how a grassroots program grows. Because if you were to do all the steps, you'd be very limited in your reach. You could only help so many people. But if you get them to do it, you can end up helping a lot more cats. So here's an example of outreach. I mentioned, you know, the different, the different places that you can use to different channels. That, again, nowadays, social media is going to be probably right up there at the top. Talked about prioritizing requests. So really, you can break it down into three, these three categories that may be helpful for you in terms of prioritizing. So your number one audience are people who are willing and able, and that's your prime audience. Next would be people who want to, who would be willing, but they're not able such as elderly and disabled. So that would become your number two priority. And the last people you want to help are the ones who are perfectly capable of doing it, but they're just not willing to. Now, in the future, you may develop a paid service where they, you know, they pay you to do it. But you got to be careful about that because you really should be spending most of your time on number one, not trying to make money on uh, number three. Although once in a while, that can be, can be helpful for bringing in resources. So training workshops kind of talked about the things that you, you can convey. Again, you want to teach people how to trap cats in a way that's effective, but it's safe. So they're never putting their hands on the cats and you're teaching them about trap dividers and things like that. You're emphasizing the importance of getting as close to all the cats as you can spayed and neutered. And mass trapping, which is what we teach in the workshops, which is, you know, getting all the cats in a group fixed at the same time, can discuss neighbor relations, best practices. I want to pause for a moment on that concept. When you're introducing trap near to return to your community, they're going to look to you as the expert for what should be done. So you have an opportunity in the beginning to set the standard of care. When we started Neighborhood Cats, Back in the day, whether to do FELV or FIV testing on every single cat that was TNR'd 
was a controversial topic. And it was controversial mostly because if the cat tested positive, the usual outcome was euthanasia. And there's all sorts of problems with that. But we set the standard as you don't test unless there's something wrong with the cat and the veterinarian wants the test as a diagnostic tool. So people didn't, we didn't get into the controversy in New York City about should you test or should you not, because we just told everybody you shouldn't and they just went with that. So you have an opportunity in the beginning to, to use these workshops to define how TNR should be done. And of course, the service providers in your area, the veterinarians and the other groups who offer any TNR related resources are really going to appreciate the fact that you're teaching people how to properly access them, how to schedule appointments, where to go, when to pick up, when to drop off, so that the more people are kind of compliant with service providers' protocols, the more willing they're going to be to provide those services. Talked about certification, and these are the types of things that in New York City, having TNR certification gives you access to. So again, for your discount spay neuter, we have the trap banks where we offer, you know, we require minimal deposits because we figure if you've gone through the workshop, you're probably not going to run off with our equipment, coaches, transportation. You know, again, we're trying to fill in any gaps that people have. So maybe they have everything, but they, in New York City, a lot of people don't have a place to hold the cats for couple of nights. So we'll help you find somebody who provides that service and help fund that food and shelter giveaways. And you can take your certification list if you want and share it with other service providers in your area if they want to use that as a prerequisite as well. So I mentioned the TNR certification workshop that Neighborhood Cats does in partnership with Community Cats podcast. And the next one coming up is on March 9th. You can register at the communitycatspodcast.com website. And it is now approved for National Animal Care and Control Association CE continuing education credit as well. So a nice thing to offer if you can, not always possible, but if you can offer follow-up in-field training, that can really solidify what people learn in the work in the uh, classroom. So could be like if you're working in an area where kind of holding classes is not going to work because your population base is too small, you could instead consider doing this kind of a model where you are going out, but in the course of trapping and doing the hands-on work, you're teaching the caretaker. You are at least require them to be present so they can see how a trap is set so they know how to handle the cat afterwards, so they know to cover the trap, how to use trap dividers to feed and clean, and expand and train as much as you can. And, you know, what we found is that each community kind of has a limit. So in New York City, we can get people, you know, to attend a two and a half hour online class. But if you're in a rural town and you've got 20 minutes when you're dropping the traps off, then that's what you got and you want to get the most out of it. So do the training that you can. If you have to limit it to hands-on stuff, then do that because it's still, it's a huge help to you if the person, if the caretaker knows how to set the trap and then you don't have to be there for every, every moment of what's going on. So essentially what we're talking about when you're running a community level TNR program is creating this network of services. And you can break it down into these three categories. There's the field work, right? You need traps, you need transport, expert assistance, holding space. That's all part of the the actual work out in the field. In terms of veterinary, low-cost surgeries are going to, you know, basically the formula is that the lower the cost, the more the TNR happens. So, you know, on one extreme, if, if the surgeries are free or they're $10 each, you're going to get a lot of demand. If the surgeries are $200 each, it's going to obviously have less demand. And the point is that you can make it work at any price point. So you just do the best you can, but have it in the back of your mind that, hey, the lower I can get this price point, the more cats I'm going to end up getting fixed. 
think about extra veterinary care, especially when you walk into a, a overpopulated cat situation, you may have illness or injuries and being able to provide that extra vet care and figure out who's going to provide it, how are you going to pay for it can be really important things. Now, in the very beginning, you may not have those resources and the answer may be, you know, we can't take on the responsibility for Fluffy's care. That's something you're going to have to do. We can point you to the lowest cost veterinarian, but you're going to have to take it from there. As your program grows, you'll have more opportunities to help these special cases because your fundraising capacity can grow and your network grows. And we do things at Neighborhood Cats now we call urgent cat appeals when we get cats who are in really bad shape and looks like they're going to run up a, a large veterinary bill. Well, we can tap into our network now and just present and say, hey, you know, this cat needs this. Can you, you know, can you donate a little bit? And just through crowdfunding, we can usually cover a lot of the bills, not for every single cat, but for for a lot of them. And then you also want to provide support to ongoing caretaking. Because again, the TNR is kind of the, the trapping is the glamour part, so to speak. But then there's years of care that's provided. So things like, you know, food giveaways and, and shelter, providing winter shelters and creating online opportunities for networking can be very helpful. And so we'll go into these in a little a little more detail. So trap banks, think about the person who just bought a house and looks into his backyard and sees six six community cats, right? And they're not fixed. So this person wants to assist, is willing to attend a training workshop, but probably what they're not willing to do is go out and buy six traps at a hundred bucks a pop, potentially in addition to paying for some of the veterinary expenses and the transport, only to use those traps one time. Because a lot of your grassroots participation are not going to be from people who want to be animal rescuers the rest of their life. It's going to be from people who encounter a particular situation and want to solve that situation, and then they're done. So they're not going to spend a lot of money on equipment for a one-time project. So the program needs to provide that. And that's where your trap banks come in. And some of the details would be you want your traps to be, we prefer 30 inches. Some programs prefer 36. Smaller they are, the more you can, somebody can fit in their car, the easier they are to lift. And we find that 30 inches are plenty of room for the traps to double as cages, which is something we go over in our basic training workshop. But they need to be at least 30 inches and they need to have a sliding rear door so that the trap can double as a cage and the caretaker can access the trap from either end. You're going to want trap uh, dividers, also called trap isolators. Make sure they're strong enough. And the only brands we recommend are Tomahawk or True Catch in terms of their fitness for this type of work. Also, drop traps are an essential tool for getting that last cat or that litter of kittens with their mother. So we do a, in partnership with the Community Cats podcast, we do a web, a free webinar on how to use a drop trap. So check that out. The uh, last one is, has, is recorded and, and you can find it on the link on the Community Cats podcast website. Okay. Moving on from trap banks. Oh, one last thing about trap banks. In case I don't mention it in the, the next slide. Is, oh, well, okay. I think actually, I think I do. So, how many traps do you need? That's going to depend on your spay neuter capacity. So, generally, you want to have twice as many traps as capacity. So, if your program is able to arrange or your community is able to provide 20, just using an arbitrary number, say 20 surgeries a week, you want to have 40 traps because You don't want to wait till the traps come back before the next round can begin, right? So you got 20 traps out there and they're filled with cats and now they're going to be held. You know, the the next person isn't going to be able to pick them up until the whole TNR process is over. That That's going to be very clunky in terms of timing. So you want the next round to be ready to go before the first round is over. And one very, very important tip that is... Don't 
try to avoid running a trap bank by appointment, meaning that each individual arranges a time with you or your program to come by and pick up and drop off traps because they're, people will drive you crazy. You know, they'll, they'll want to come at all different times. They'll cancel at the last minute. Some people won't show up. They'll come the next day. You can do it if you have that kind of patience. We found it just wasted an awful lot of our time. And so we switched to, hey, the trap bank's open from 10 a.m. to noon on Saturday, and that's when you got to come. You pick it up, that's when you drop it off. And it works, it's worked quite well. Trapping support, we talked about having a TNR coach, which is somebody experienced in TNR, being there on the first day and then acting as somebody who the caretaker call for advice. Also, you can provide ongoing email and phone advice while the trapping's going on. And as your program grows and you have more and more people experienced, you want to create a volunteer network where people are helping each other. And that's where kind of online forums come in really handy is, hey, I need help. Uh, I'm going out of town for a few days. Can somebody feed my colony? Or I need an extra spay neuter spot or I can't find trans. I need help with transport. And then people start to solve problems among themselves without you and your program having to get in the middle of it. And that is obviously the most efficient way possible for it to go. Holding spaces where you're going to be holding the cats, the caretakers holding the cats before the surgery and then for one or two days afterwards. Any space that's warm, dry, and secure, meaning it's at least 65 degrees Fahrenheit post-surgery because otherwise, well, cats can't, they, when they're under anesthesia, they lose control of their body temperature. Calling all kitten enthusiasts. Get ready for a one-of-a-kind, two-day virtual experience dedicated entirely to kittens. Introducing the 2024 Online Kitten Conference, taking place on June 8th and 9th from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time and presented by the Community Cats Podcast and the National Kitten Coalition. Prepare to be whisked away into a world of adorable antics and invaluable insight as leading experts gather to celebrate and educate on all things kitten. From newborn care to playful behavior, this conference is a treasure trove of knowledge for anyone committed to improving the lives of these fluffy bundles of joy. Whether you're a seasoned kitten rescuer or new to animal welfare and eager to learn the ropes, the Online Kitten Conference offers a perfect blend of practical advice and in-depth details about the new and the now in kitten care. From empowering fosters to preventing upper respiratory disease, from kitten socialization and behavioral well-being to what we know about kitten mortality and how we can help each other deal with loss, the weekend's live sessions, engaging workshops, and intimate discussions are crafted to nurture your passion and enhance your knowledge of these pint-sized burr machines so you can make a difference. Access to our exclusive Facebook group is included with your registration. There, you can connect with fellow kitten lovers from across the globe, share your experiences, and discover innovative approaches to kitten care and advocacy. Also included is access to recordings of all sessions. You can review anything you miss, or if you found something particularly interested, check it out again. And you'll also be able to participate in fun cat trivia and prizes. Some lucky attendee will even win a cage from CDE Cages. With the convenience of an online platform, you can join in the fun from the comfort of your own couch, surrounded by your own furry friends and probably your kitten fosters. Visit communitycatspodcast.com slash kittencon now to reserve your spot in the 2024 Online Kitten Conference. Once again, that website for details and registration is communitycatspodcast.com slash kittencon. Let's come together, celebrate the smallest felines, and pave the way for a bright future for these precious creatures. Don't miss out. Register today. In a recent study, 97% of respondents said that pets are family. Communities can play a vital role in helping to keep families together. Whether it's reuniting lost pets with their owners, donating pet supplies or funds for pet owners in need, or offering short or long-term fostering, people can help keep pets and their people together. We just have to show them how. Did you know there are resources you can use to help bring attention to the programs you offer to help them do just that? From public service announcement, short videos, printable posters, online and social graphics, and much more. Find your resources at www.petsandpeopletogether.org slash campaign dash resources. Hashtag be a helper. Tomahawk Live Trap exceeds customers' expectations by providing them with the highest quality humane animal control products available. Check out their new Pro Series Gravity Door Trap. They feature a door that sets automatically when you open it. 
no hook or plate setting needed. Use discount code Keep It Humane for 10% off your order at livetrap.com. It's happening this Saturday. Join us this Saturday to learn the art of trap new to return, a powerful way to transform the lives of community cats. Brought to you by Community Cats Podcast and Neighborhood Cats. This session is for anyone who wants to turn their passion for cats into action. Whether you're a seasoned caretaker or just starting out, there's something for everyone to learn. Don't wait. Reserve your spot now at communitycatspodcast.com slash get TNR certified. If you take a cat who's still under anesthesia and you put them in a cold space, that could potentially be fatal. So depending on the protocols of the clinic and when you get the cats back, you want to make sure the space is warm enough for them. Dry, obviously protected from the weather and secure that other animals, and people not associated with your project can't get in. What you're looking at here is the what we call the TNR via at the Maui Humane Society. And it's you know, kind of the gold standard. There's lots of space. The traps are up on tables. The tables are lined with uh, contractor paper. And uh, pardon me if you hear my, my dove is yelling in the background. <laughs> He's tired of me talking. But it doesn't have to be as fancy as this. We've had holding space in people's garages, in their basements. We've rented vans to keep them in parked and, you know, safely if it's secure in people's driveways. We've used warehouses, empty store spaces, the rooms and houses, you name it. It can be a holding space. Transport can be a big issue. So if you step in as a program and help with that, it, it can be a, you know, a big help. Think about the different elements of transport. You have to pick up traps, drop off traps. You have to drive the cats to and from the spay-neuter clinic, and you have to transport the cats from the colony site to the holding space and eventually back to the colony site. So if somebody doesn't have a large SUV or something like that, then maybe getting a volunteer to help with the transport or funding a van for a couple of days can help get a TNR, make a TNR project happen. We talked about spay neuter, the lower the cost, the higher the participation. Uh, point number two is a real important one where we see a lot of mistakes in community TNR programs, which is again that idea of fairness that, you know, we have 10 people who are asking for slots and we've got 50 of them at our next clinic. So we're going to get everybody five. Well, that's great for the people, but it doesn't maximize the impact of your surgeries on the cat population, which is supposed to be the goal, right? We're not a social services agency as a TNR program. Our ultimate clients are the cats. And we want to make sure that we're maximizing our positive impact on them and, of course, helping the caretakers along the way. But doling out surgeries by some rote kind of, well, we have this many we're going to divide by the caretakers, doesn't get you to high sterilization levels. And so, as we talked about before, does not help maximize the reduction over time of the cat population. Make sure that any, usually clinics offer special rates for TNR cats, lower rates. A lot of people will try to game that system. By requiring that the cats be ear tipped, you will not eliminate that gaming of the system, but you can at least greatly reduce it. One cat per trap covered. If you're working with veterinarians who are not experienced with feral cats, you want to train them how to handle them. Don't transfer the cats out of traps into cages. Leave them in the traps. Show them how to feed and clean using trap dividers, stuff like that. You may walk in there in the beginning and know more than the veterinary staff does about handling feral cats if they are feral. So show them. Don't be, don't be shy about it. Provide them with trap dividers if they don't have a pair. So we are experiencing a veterinary shortage. I'm sorry, this slide's a little out. In New York City, we do have what we call it. Now, it used to be Ask Your Vet, but the newest incarnation is SNAP, Spay Neuter Assistance Program, where we assist caretakers with the cost of surgeries, which in New York City used to be free. And then all of a sudden, the COVID and the veterinary shortage came and they became a lot more expensive. So we devote a lot of our resources now to helping to subsidize spay neuter costs and make it affordable for people to get this done. Another thing you can do is you can support 
kind of large grassroots clinics where, you know, 100, 200 cats are fixed in a weekend. Usually those are held once or twice a month. Training veterinarians on high volume techniques. There are programs popping up. There's one in, I know in Southern California. There's a veterinarian in Pennsylvania. Good place to go for information about this is the United Spay Alliance. Go to their website, contact them about if you have a veterinarian who's interested, where they might be able to get trained. And in light of the shortage that we're experiencing of spay neuter, I just want to point out that it makes targeting, kind of targeting we talked about in the beginning, even more important that we use our resources as efficiently as we can. And always just keep in mind, like even at the height, the crisis in New York City, which has begun to ease, where it was really hard to find appointments, that doesn't, that will affect the pace at which you can move, right? So obviously, the more expensive they are and the scarcer they are uh, in terms of spay neuter surgeries, the slower the progress you can make. But that doesn't mean you can't make progress. So don't let it psych you out to the point where you're like, oh, we can't do this. Work with what you have. Try to grow that capacity. But keep moving forward because it may seem really slow today. And then in six months, a new clinic opens up and it's gotten a lot better. So just always do the best you can with what you have. Online networks for caretakers, like I said, is a great way for people to solve their own problems without bringing them to you, which is a great thing. Like I said, solve transport, trapping, feeding, the Maui. Well, it's not called this anymore. I think they renamed the group. But at the time I made this slide, it was called the Maui Cat Coalition. And there were a couple thousand people actually that were participating in this. So a lot of problem solving going on among within the network itself. And your role as a TNR program is simply to kind of create that forum. And probably you need to spend a little bit of time moderating it so that it stays focused and on point and is, you know, a safe place where people want to be part of. Also, the CommuniCats podcast has a conference Facebook group, which has a couple of thousand people. That's a great, great place to join as well. You know, you'll get more of the general advice and, and to- on topics as opposed to, I need somebody to help me feed today, but good network to be a uh, part of. You want to be developing an email network, always be collecting people's email addresses. And also, because, you know, nonprofits need to fundraise, be collecting their mail address, their snail mail addresses too. A network of caretakers is a great thing when you need to fight, you know, you need to advocate for the cats. We've had on Maui a few years ago, some of the uh, conservationists tried to get the county council to basically ban the uh, ban TNR, ban the feeding of cats outdoors. Well, having that network that strong and available really kind of blew away the opposition and kind of quickly put, you know, that attempt to rest. Also, social events are a good way to keep your network alive, occasionally have a fundraiser, and just so people can get together, spend a little time together. Food is probably, if you were to ask, do a survey of your caretakers, what's your top priority in terms of the assistance you need from us post-spay-neuter? It's going to be food. You know, it can just be an ongoing struggle for some people to feed the cats. So, to the extent that you can get a hold of free food and then distribute it, you obviously you're never going to be able to provide everybody with all the food they need, but even a little bit now and then. So check out local pet stores for recently expired food that's still still good. Holiday drives are a great time to kind of collect the stash, maybe get a storage room from you know or somewhere to store it, somebody's garage for. A month or two, collect a whole bunch in the hol- over the holidays and then give it out to people. We also, in New York City, we have a caretaker in need fund where people, if they lose their job, but they're, so we can help them pay for the food for a couple of months. You know, things like that are all going to be supportive of keeping your community TNR program thriving. Finally, shelter and straw giveaways if you're in colder climates like New York City. Every year we arrange 
to get pre-made winter shelters for cats from from local manufacturers. And then we just pass them along at cost, plus provide straw. Because an individual caretaker, I mean, it's not like, you know, there are cat winter shelters for sale at Walmart. You have to find kind of local people who are doing this probably as a part-time gig and don't have the, you know, the kind of network of uh, transport and delivery and things like that. So if you can get people shelters at cost and make it convenient for them to pick them up at a certain location at time, uh, that's going to help a lot. And every year, you know, people we give, we don't give away, but we uh, pass on at cost, you know, hundreds of shelters. We do give away those to those people who just can't afford them. And you can see here, this is a a photo of a straw giveaway. That's a a bale of straw. And, you know, by the end of the day, it will have handed out garbage bags to an awful lot of people. So again, I want to emphasize that there are community online resources and can at times feel like you're alone doing this work, but there's a lot of people doing it. And here's some of the resources available from Neighborhood Cats and Community Cats Podcasts. But I would say, you know, your number one resource is you want to join Community Cats Pod Facebook. Okay, Stacey, I think we can take on the question Q&A right now if you'd like. Okay, so we have a question actually that was sent in before the session even started. A lot of the conversation, your presentation focused on your experience in New York. You know, how do we approach building a, a movement in rural areas that might have a different set of problems than in urban areas? How would you approach a rural area? Well, when I was a grants manager at PetSmart Charities, we would, our TNR grants required targeting, required really focusing on the community. And there was one a rural community in Connecticut. And the person that was, you know, implementing the project was having a lot of trouble, you know, getting people to be involved and talking about a, a farming community where people are spread far out and, the, and there may be a population of a couple thousand people at the most. Well, you know, holding training workshops and knowing from having done this once, you, know, you could you could hold a workshop and nobody will come, right? So that's not going to be a very effective way to do it. So we went about with this particular project just trying to solve that puzzle, like what will work? And in the end, what we found was, and this is a community where the person doing the project had lived for eight years, was considered a newcomer, you know, that kind of thing. So it took talking to the farmers and going to this, you know, doing face to face and educating them about what you're doing. And eventually she found one who was willing, like that pilot project idea, who was willing to give it a try. And then she went all in on making sure that project worked. And then the guy started telling his neighbors like, oh, hey, you know, my cat problem's a lot better now. And start to spread that way. And then befriended the one animal control officer in town who happened to be feeding some intact cats. So she did a TNR project for her. And then all of a sudden her eyes opened like, wow, this is a great thing. So I think when you're in a smaller community, like a rural community, there's going to be a lot more face-to-face, -face, a lot more talking to people, a lot more, hey, let's give it a try. And then let the kind of word of mouth take over. But each community is going to be a little bit different. The big city model is just certainly not going to work everywhere. Bits and pieces of it will, like you're still going to need a trap bank and you're, you still want to develop an online network to the extent you can and things like that. But how you break the ice is going to be a little bit different, but it can be done. It ended up being a very, what started off very slowly, ended up being a very successful project. I also know in Vermont, they don't really even use the word community cats much or feral cats. It's pretty much all barn cat programs right. in Vermont. Yeah, yeah. And that's using the language the community is used to. I know I did one project in a rural part of Wisconsin. And all they had to do was like give them some basic instructions. Like, and here's where you bring the cats and give them the traps. And the farmers did all the hands-on work themselves. You know, they didn't need or want uh, hands-on assistance or instruction. They just give me the equipment and tell me where to bring the cats. So again, it's finding out what works in your community, not being too rigid about how you approach it. And if you're running into a scenario where somebody is 
very anti TNR and it's sort of a new area, go where you're going to be successful first. Don't fight that person. Yeah. You know, if you're an alternative, go to what's going to be successful. Yeah, I think that's an excellent piece of advice. You probably should put that in the presentation because, yeah, there is a tendency among people in the rescue community to be drawn to the most difficult situations, you know. Like if you have an opportunity to do like a pilot project like this, the city says, okay, here's $2,000. We're going to waive whatever laws that might be in your way and you've got six months to do it. You know, most rescuers will be like, oh my God, now I can finally tackle the 50 black cats who appear at four in the morning behind the railroad station, right? But they should be saying, let me go find my best friend and her 20 cats who we could probably just pick up and put in the traps. That should be your pilot because in the end, nobody else is going to know one was hard, one was difficult. They're either going to say it was successful or it failed. So you go to where it's easiest in the beginning, not to where it's hardest. So once you build up your program, then you go get the 50 cats behind the railroad station. But, you know, you need to build up to that. Definitely. A couple of questions about how to develop new spay neuter capacity or making connections with veterinarians for veterinary support, broken legs, injuries, that kind of thing. Any tips on how to get involved with new veterinarians? Yeah. I mean, there's one thing to understand is there's no magic formula, right? There's no magic recitation of words that's going to make them go, oh, okay. What you can do is just be very straightforward. And this is the situation in our community. These are the services that we need. You know, would you be interested in trying it? And then they will be interested or they won't, right? But, you know, sometimes I think people think like we have some abracadabra, <laughs> right? And then all of a sudden they're pro TNR and want to help you. Every veterinarian is a little bit different. So keep that in mind. Just be straightforward. And then if somebody does show interest, a couple of really important tips are start off slow. You know, don't come in and say, wow, you know, we need 100 spay neuters a, a month or we're never going to keep up with this. Ask them if they can do a couple a week. You know, let them get to know you. Let them get to experience the process. And then as they do, if you are, you know, a good client, it will naturally grow into more services. And then that's the second part of it is be a good client. You'd be surprised how many rescue groups get these opportunities with veterinarians and then they blow them because they don't pay the bill on time or they don't pick up the cat at the right time or they try to squeeze them for more services than they're willing to offer and they end up alienating the veterinarians instead of developing a growing relationship. Yeah. And if, if folks are interested in pursuing this topic, certainly the United Spay Alliance is really actively involved. We even have a vet shortage task force that is working on different types of solutions to help increase spay neuter capacity. I will say California just passed some legislation that is now putting um, in place a way for vet techs to be able to do neuters on cats in the Great. state of California. So trying to think of some time-saving solutions so that we can have our veterinarians do the veterinary work that they need to do and really elevating the status of our technicians to be able to do some of the very life-saving work that, that they can do. So California is leading the charge on that. And then Colorado has some telemedicine options out there too, which may play a role to a certain degree with regards to community cats or seeing a cat that you can't get your hands on immediately but might need some treatment, that kind of thing too. So there are some outside of the box uh, type solutions in the works. I will also suggest let you folks know that we have a wet lab program at the United Spay Alliance also, which is helping to teach private practice veterinarians as well as well, any veterinarian out there that wants to learn how to do high quality, high volume spay neuter techniques as a best practice would be able to do this. And our goal is to have one wet lab in every state, potentially multiple times a month. And it's a way for local veterinarians to network with each other where we as TNR folks, we don't talk to each other. Well, veterinarians don't talk to each other either. And so they need to network and work together and be able to band together, support each other. And these wet labs have become a great resource for them. And also uh, high quality, high volume spay neuter techniques 
that are used in our clinics, that's not what's used in a standard private practice. Mm -hmm. It is a best practice to use these high quality, high volume spay neuter techniques. The mortality rates are lower, you know, the numbers are higher. So if we can encourage that to move into private practice, that will build them with extra time for extra capacity for our caps. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, it can be as simple as like, you can save a lot of time as a veterinarian if you take your sutures off a spool as opposed to opening individual packets. So just some a simple tip like that is not known to most private veterinarians, but if they get exposure to high volume techniques, they become more efficient and they can do more. And that helps them in their private practice as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wet Labs, it's a training session uh, to help train veterinarians. And you can look at the Wet Labs on the USA page. What's their web address, Stacey? UnitedSpayAlliance.org. And then for Wet Labs, there's what, if you go down one of the projects and the, 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 it has a Wet Lab feral, the Vet Shortage Task Force and Wet Labs are in there, projects are in there. Okay, that's just a comment. Somebody's like, I don't understand why they wouldn't want to have a... So one of the things you do learn when you're in a wet lab is most veterinarians come in with an incision this size and they come out with an incision this size, which is actually probably pretty big, maybe even smaller than that. So they learn these techniques. And if you've got a feral cat outside, you know, you certainly... I would love to share this to the like, public health officials or whatever. I don't want an incision this size. I want an, a much smaller incision for those cats that are out there. Just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and then they heal a lot faster, and they have to. You have to spend less resources on recovery. And do you have any recommendations, Brian? We'll do this last question on how to deal with you know HOAs, commercial property establishments, restaurants. I mean, it's part of creating a movement, but it's like you're you're going at a, one project at a time. So how do you work with those organizations? Well, again, you want to t first of all, you know, just your demeanor should be a cooperative one that you're looking to, you're a problem solver. They're, you know, they probably had a situation with cats for some period of time, right? You probably didn't just, you appear and the cats appear at the same time. So, and they may well have tried to address that, you know, maybe by hiring a, an extermination company or getting the local ACO to trap them and take them away if they're still willing to do that. Most aren't anymore. And the cats are back. So, if you come in and you offer your situation and your services and you do it in a cooperative, non-threatening way, my experience is that most people are willing to give it a try. People love pilots. People love trying things out. You know, it's like, try, buy this and try it for 30 days. And, you know, it's the <laughs> same thing with TNR, right? You want to give them a kind of risk-free opportunity to give it a shot. And if you take that approach, like, what have you got to lose? In the beginning of a movement, you know, we always tried to make it cost free, you know, so if it was a high profile project, we felt like this is really going to boost our publicity and our reach. We would just say, all you got to do is open the door and we would do as much as we could. That's not the standard approach when you're growing your grassroots program and reaching. But in the beginning, when you're trying to get people to accept it, you want to make it as easy as possible for them. So we would talk to the board of directors at an HOA and answer their questions and, you know, offer to do this at no cost to them. You know, the restaurant owner, you know, whoever it is, if you come in and you say, just give it a try, you know, what have you got to lose? In my experience, most people will give you that opportunity. And then, of course, you want to make the absolute most of it. And then you have an example. And when you go to the next restaurant, you might say, Hey, look at Fabiano's, you know, situation there is much better. Why don't you give the guy a call if you're not sure, but I need you to cover the cost of the search. Yep. Yeah, no. And I think sharing what your neighbor's done, I mean, or what you've done at a neighbor's is definitely the way to go. So yeah, again, stressing that first pilot project better be successful. Yeah. And you have that on your calling card because they're not going to care who you are. They're going to care about the success of the project down the street. And they'll call, you know, Fabiano or whoever. They'll call, they'll like, yo, what's going on down there? And, you know, find out what's going on and check you out. Make sure you're, you're really who you say you are. And then you just build on that. It's a business. It's like building a business reputation, really. Yeah. It's like the first park we worked in in New York City. We did a really, really good job, you know, and then word got out to all the parks in New York City, right? Because it's the parks department. 
that's how the word spreads is, you know, you do it really well. And then once you're having a lot of demand, now the movement has shifted to a different place and you can probably be a little more demanding what you're requiring and a little more selective about what you do. But in the beginning, yeah, you want to totally stack the deck, you know, and make sure that you have that early success to use as a model. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.